Gibran Khalil Gibran. Ninfas Valley. 1948. Martin. The girl's father died while Marta was still in the crib and her mother passed away before the girl was 10. He went to live his orphan years in the house of a poor neighbor, who, with his wife and children, lived on the fruits of the earth in a small isolated village, in one of the beautiful valleys of Lebanon. When Marta's father died, he left her name and a poor hut that stood between walnut trees and poplars as an heirloom. From his mother inherited only tears of pain and his total orphanship. She lived as a foreigner in the land where she was born, alone among leafy trees and tall rocks. Every morning the girl walked barefoot, dressed in rags, and would milk the cows in a region of the valley where the grass was rich, and there the girl sat in the shade of a tree. He sings with the birds and cried. With the stream, while addicted to cows for having abundant food. I watched the flowers and the fluttering of butterflies. As the sun set on the horizon, hunger dominated her, and she returned to the hut, to sit next to her tutor's daughter and eat a sparse bit of cornbread, with some dried trout and wet beans, in vinegar and olive oil. After the frugal dinner, he stretched out the dry bucket on the floor in a corner, and lay down, resting his head on his arms. Then he fell asleep and sighed, and wished that life would be a long and deep sleep, without dreams and without waking up. Near dawn, she was rudely awakened by her guardian to serve him, and the girl awoke trembling in fear of her guardian's hardness and anger. Thus came several years in the life of Martha, the unfortunate, between those distant hills and remote valleys. Soon the girl began to feel in her heart the awakening of emotions that until then had not experienced, it was like feeling the scent of a flower's heart. Strange dreams and thoughts revolved through it, like a flock crossing a river. The woman awoke in it and looked like fresh and virgin land prepared to receive the seed of knowledge and feel the traces of experience. She was a demure and pure young woman, exiled by an inscrutable decree of fate on that isolated farm, whose life was ruled in all its phases by the seasons. It was like a shadow of an unknown god, residing between the earth and the sun. Those of us who have spent most of their lives in populous cities know very little about the lives of those who live in Lebanon's remote villages and towns. We are driven by the current of modern civilization. We forget, or so we think, the philosophy of this beautiful and simple life, full of purity and spiritual frankness. But if we look at that life, we would see her smile in the spring, see her napping in the summer sun, we would see her harvest in the fall and we would rest in the winter, and consider her our mother nature in all her moods. We are richer in material goods than those villagers, but the peasant's spirit is nobler than ours. We sow much and we reap nothing, instead, whatever they sow they harvest. We who live in the city are slaves to our appetites, are the children of simple joy. We drink in the chalice of life a cloudy liquid with bitterness, despair, fears, and boredom. They drink the clear wine of simple life. Marta was 16. His soul was a bright mirror that reflected all the beauty of the fields, and his heart was like the wide valleys, which repeated, like an echo, the sounds of the dula. Nature One autumn day, when the field seemed full of sadness, the girl sat on the edge of a stream, feeling that her soul was free from the ground prison, like the thoughts of a poet's imagination, and watched the dance of the yellow leaves falling from the trees. I saw how the wind played with those leaves, just as death plays with the souls of men. I looked at the wilted flowers, with their hearts dry and broken into a thousand pieces. The flowers kept their seeds in the boist of the earth, just as the women hid their jewels in times of war and disturbances. As the girl looked at the flowers and trees, sharing the pain of the plants in the autumn, she heard the sound of the horses' hoofs on the broken stones of the valley. 
she turned her head and saw that a knight was advancing slowly toward her, their harnesses and his clothes spoke of wealth and well-being. This knight dismounted and greeted her kindly, with a delicacy that no man had with her. I've lost my way to the coast. Could you point me out? I'm asking you. The girl rose by the creek, erect like a young branch, and answered. I don't know, sir, but I'm going to ask my tutor, because he knows. In saying these words, the girl felt a little afraid, and the shyness and modesty of her accent enhanced her youth and beauty. She was already leaving when the man stopped her with a gesture. The red wine of youth ran vigorously in his veins, and his gaze changed when he said, No, don't go. The young woman stood, with an expression of surprise, for she had felt in that voice a force that prevented her from moving. She looked furtively at the knight, who in turn looked at her attentively, with a look she could not understand. Then he gave her a smile so charming, so sued, that the girl wanted to cry. The man cast an affectionate look at his bare feet, his delicate wrists, his soft neck, his hair soft and thick. He noticed, with increasing passion, the tanned skin and those arms that nature had strengthened. But the girl remained silent and ashamed. She didn't want to leave, and for reasons she couldn't explain, she couldn't talk either. The dairy cow went back to the stable that afternoon without the owner, because Marta didn't come back. When his tutor returned from the camps, he looked everywhere for her and couldn't find her. He called her name, but got no answer beyond the echoes of the caves and the howl of the wind in the treetops. He returned to his sad cabin and told his wife what had happened. The peasant cried softly all night and said, amid the sobs. I saw her in a dream, in the clutches of a wild beast, who torn her body to pieces as she smiled and cried. That's Marta's story when she lived in that beautiful village. It was told to me by an old villager who had known her since she was little. The girl had disappeared from that region, leaving behind only a few tears in the eyes of a peasant woman and a pathetic memory that wandered with the morning breeze over the valley, and then, as a child's breath in the glass of a window disappeared forever. 2. I returned to Beirut in the fall of 1900, after spending my student vacation in northern Lebanon. Why on test evolver a missa studios passe una semana vagando al redditor de la ciudad en compañía de algunos camaradas, sabriendo las delicias de la libertad, de la que los jóvenes estén hambrentos, y que es y la niega en sus casas y en las cuatro paredes de as alas. At this age, and on vacation, the young man is like a bird that, finding the cage open, flies full of joy, with a heart full of trills and the joy of escape. Youth is a beautiful dream, but its sweetness is enslaved by the boredom of books, and its awakening is painful. Perhaps the day comes when the wise can unite the dreams of youth and the pleasure of learning, as trust unites hearts in conflict. Perhaps there will come a day when the master of man is nature, a humanity, his book, and life, his school. Will that day come? We do not know, but we feel the urgency that propels us upwards towards spiritual progress, and this progress is the understanding of the beauty that exists in all that is created, through the goodness that exists in us and the expansion of happiness through our love. For this beauty. That afternoon, I was sitting on the porch of my house, watching people's movements and listening to the screams of the street vendors, each praising the excellence of their merchandise and food, when a boy approached me. He was about five years old, dressed in rags, and carried on his shoulder a tray full of branches of flowers. With a trembling and faint voice, as if it were part of her long and suffering heritage, she asked me to buy her some flowers. I looked at that pale face, where black eyes shone, darkened by the shadows of sickness and poverty, 
his mouth was like an open scar on an injured chest, her thin, bare arms and skeletal body bowed under the weight of the flower tray, like a rose bush withered among fresh green plants. I saw all this in a single glance and smiled with pity, a smile in which there was the bitterness of tears. One of those smiles that is born deep in our hearts and emerges on our lips, if we repress those smiles, they are reflected in our eyes. I bought him some flowers, but it was his speech that I wanted to buy, because I felt that in his sad looks and in his pitiful aspect a tragedy was hidden, the tragedy of the poor, perpetually represented on the stage of the day. Speaking to him with kind words, he was friendly, as if he had found someone who could offer him a little protection and security. He looked at me in amazement, because his species is only accustomed to being mistreated by other children, who regard street children as worthless things, and not as little souls wounded by the arrows of misfortune. So I asked her name. Fuad, he answered, his eyes fixed on the ground. I continued. Whose son are you and where is your family? I'm Marta's son, a woman from the city of Ban. And who's your father? I asked him. He shook his head like someone who doesn't know who his father is. So where's your mother, Fuad? At home, sick. These few words from that child's lips rekindled in my ears with familiar accents, and in my deepest sense strange images of melancholy were formed, for I knew immediately that the unfortunate Martha, whose story I had heard from the villagers, lived, sick, in Beirut. That girl who still lived yesterday among the trees and the valleys, far from suffering, suffered the hard wreaths of hunger and pain in the big city. The orphan who had spent her childhood in dialogue with nature, caring for cows in the beautiful meadows, had been swept away by the tide of corrupt civilization, to become prey to misery and misfortune. As these ideas passed through my mind, the child kept looking at me, as if to see with the eyes of his innocent spirit the suffering of my heart. The little boy made mention of leaving, but I took his hand and said, Take me where your mother is, I want to see it. He led me through the streets, he walked before me in silence and marveled. Every now and then he would look back to see if I was really following him. I felt fear and sadness. I walked through dirty alleys where the air was cloudy with the breath of death, and passed through shacks where addicted men gave in to evil deeds behind the night curtains. We passed alleys where the wind squeaked like a snake, and I walked after that young boy, with an innocent heart and mute courage. He had the courage of those who know the wickedness of a city known in the Middle East as the Bride of Syria and the Pearl in the Crown of Kings. Finally we arrived in a wretched suburb, and the boy entered a very humble house, which the passing of the years had turned into pitiful ruins. I went in behind him, feeling my heart beat fast. I found myself in the middle of a small room where the air was damp. For each furniture there was a lamp whose dim light cut through the darkness with yellowish rays, and a kitra whose appearance spoke of the most extreme poverty, abandonment, and necessity. In this kitra slept a woman with her face facing the wall, as if in her wanted to take refuge from the cruelties of the world, or perhaps he saw in the carcomatous stones a more suit and compassionate heart than that of men. The boy approached the woman, shouting, Mom, I'm sorry. Mother. The woman turned to us and saw the boy, who pointed at me. She made a defensive move under the rags that covered her and, in a bitter voice for the sufferings of an agonizing spirit, exclaimed, What do you want from me, man? You come to buy the last remnants of my life to quench your sure soft pleasure? Get away from me, because the streets are full of women willing to sell their bodies and their souls cheap. I have nothing to sell but a few sighs, which death will soon buy with the peace of the grave. I went to his bed. That woman's words reached the bottom of my heart, because they were the end of a sad story. 
I spoke to her, wanting my feelings to flow along with my words, don't be afraid of me, Marta. I didn't come to see you as an animal of prey, but as a sad man. I am from Lebanon and I have been living for a long time among those valleys and villages, near the cedar forests. Fear nothing, Marta. The woman heard my words and knew that they came from the depths of a spirit that wept with her, for she trembled in her bed like a naked branch in the winter wind. She took her hands to her face, as if she wanted to hide from that sad, terrifying memory in her sweetness and bitter in her beauty. After a silence and a sigh, his face reappeared between his trembling shoulders. I saw his deep eyes that seemed to be looking at something invisible there, in the emptiness of that room, and I saw that his lips trembled with despair. Death was already snoring in his throat, with a deep, pitiful groan. Then he spoke with a tone of supplication, weakened by pain. You have come here moved by kindness and compassion, and if it is true that compassion for sinners is a godly act, and if compassion for those who have gone away is meritorious, heaven will reward you. But I ask you to step away from here and return to where you came from, for your presence here will embarrass you, and your compassion for me will yield insult and contempt. Go before anyone sees you in this pig-stained room. Walk quickly and cover your face with the cape, so no passerby can recognize you. The compassion you feel will not restore my purity, nor will it erase my sin, nor will you remove the mighty hand of death that already weighs on me. My wickedly and my faults have thrown into these dark depths. May your compassion not bring you contempt. I'm a leper who lives between graves. Don't come near me so people don't think you're dirty and walk away from you. Return now to those sacred valleys, but do not mention my name, for the shepherd will reject the sick sheep, that his flock may not be counted. And if you ever need to talk about me, tell me Marta, a woman from the city of Ban, died, don't say it anymore. Then he took his son's little hands, and kissed them sadly. He sighed and spoke again. People will look at my son with contempt and ridicule, saying that he is the son of sin, they will say that he is the son of Martha, the whore, the son of shame and chance. They will say worse things about him, because people are blind, and they will not see that his mother has purified his childhood with pain and tears, and that he does. Given life with its sorrows and misfortunes. I will die, leaving you orphaned among the children of the street, alone in your existence, mercilessly, with a terrible memory as the only inheritance. If you are cowardly and weak, you will be ashamed of this memory, but if you are brave and righteous, your blood will circulate with pride. If heaven preserves you and gives you the strength to become a man, heaven will help you fight those who have harmed you and your mother. But if he dies and frees himself from the weight of the years, he will find me in it, beyond, where everything is light and rest, waiting for his arrival. My heart inspired me these words. You are not a leper, Marta, even though you lived among the graves. You are not unclean, though life has placed you in the hands of the unclean. The impurity of the flesh cannot reach the pure spirit, and the snowflakes cannot kill the living seeds. What is life but a time of sorrow where the grain of souls spreads before it bears fruit? Let us have mercy on the wheat that does not fall into the thre stir, for the ants of the earth will take it, and the birds of heaven will take it, and that wheat will not enter the barns of the owner of the field. You are a victim of oppression, Martha, and the one who oppressed you was born in a palace, and you are great for your wealth, but small in soul. You are persecuted and despised, but it is better that a person be the oppressed, not the oppressor, and it is better to fall victim to human instincts, than to be powerful enough to crush the flowers of life and disfigure the beauties of feeling with evil desires. The soul is a link of the divine current. 
The heat of life can twist this link and destroy the beauty of its surroundings, but it cannot turn its gold into another metal, on the contrary, heat can make the precious metal shine more. But unfortunately, he who is weak, and who allows fire to consume him and turn him into ashes, so that the winds may spread them upon the face of the desert. Yes, Marta, you are a flower crushed by the silver of the animal that hides in the human being. Heavy feet passed over you and brought you down, but they did not annihilate that fragrance that rises with the lament of widows and the weep of orphans, and the sigh of the poor to heaven, the source of justice and mercy. To comfort you, Marta, to know that you are the crushed flower, not the foot that crushed you. Martha had listened to me carefully, and her face shone with a little comfort, like clouds illuminated by the soft rays of the setting sun. She invited me to sit next to her. I did this, trying to read in his eloquent strokes the hidden shadows of his sad spirit. He had the look of those who know he's about to die. It was the look of a girl still in the spring of life, who feels the footsteps of death approaching her bed. The gaze of a forgotten woman, who recently walked through the beautiful valleys of Lebanon, full of life and energy, and who at that moment, exhausted, was only waiting for the liberation of the bonds of existence. After a moved silence, that woman gathered her last strength and began to speak, and her tears gave a deeper meaning to her words, for she seemed to put her soul in every faint hiccup, and she said to me, Yes, I'm an oppressed woman, I am the prey of the animal that lives in man, the trampled flower. I was sitting on the edge of the creek when he passed, on horseback. He spoke kindly to me and said that I was beautiful, that he loved me and that he would never forget me. He also said that the great spaces were desolate places, and that the valleys were abodes of birds and jackals. He took me in his arms, pulled me to his chest and kissed me. Until then I didn't know the taste of kisses, because I was a helpless orphan. He put me on the back of his horse and took me to a beautiful lonely house. There he gave me dresses of seed, perfumes, and rich delicacies. All this he did smiling, but behind his sweet words and his loving gestures he hid his lust and his animal desires. And when he was satisfied with my body and the humiliation of my spirit, he left, leaving me a living flame that grew softly. Then I fell into this darkness, source of pain and bitter tears. Thus life was divided for me into two parts, one weak and helpless, and the other smaller, who wept in the silences of the night, seeking to return to the great emptiness. In that lonely house my oppressor left me and my son in his arms, surrendered to the cruelties of hunger, cold, and loneliness. We had no other companion but him, fear, no more comfort than crying. That man's friends came to see me and realized my needs and weaknesses. They came one after the other with the intention buy me with riches and give me bread in exchange for my honor. Oh, I would often deliberate my spirit with my own hand, but I did not, because my life no longer belonged to me alone, it was also my son, that heaven separated from his kingdom, just as life separated me and sank me into the depths of the abyss and now, is near the time when my boyfriend, the spirit of death, he will come to me after a long absence, to take me to his soft bed. After a deep silence that was like the presence of invisible spirits, she looked at me, a look in which the shadows of death were already visible, and with a sweet voice she continued. Oh, Justice, that you're hiding, behind these terrifying images. You, and only you can hear the lament of my departing spirit, and the cry of my abandoned heart. All I ask is that you have mercy on me, that with your right hand you may protect my son, and with your left you will receive my spirit. His strength subsided and his breathing became weaker. She looked at her son with a painfully sued look, then slowly lowered her eyes and, in an almost silent voice, 
began to recite. Our Father you are in heaven. His voice ceased to be heard, but his lips continued to move for a while. So every movement left your body. A shudder ran through the woman, she sighed one last time, and her face turned intensely pale. The spirit left the body, and the eyes continued to look at the invisible. At dawn, Martha's body was placed in a wooden coffin and carried on the shoulders of two humble people. We buried her in a deserted field, far from the city, because the priests did not want to pray about those remains, nor did they let Martha's bones rest in the cemetery, where the crosses are sentinels of the tombs. There were no more mourners who accompanied the corpse to that distant grave than Martha's son and another boy, whom the adversities of life taught him to be compassionate. The dust of the ages and the eternal fire. I. Autumn 116 AC. It was a silent night and all living things slept in the city of the sun. The lamps of the houses scattered throughout the great temples, among olive trees and laurels, have long since gone out. The moon rose on the horizon, its rays bathing the whiteness of the tall marble columns that rose like gigantic sentinels in the quiet night, guarding the sanctuaries of the gods. These sentinels seemed to look with admiration and admiration at the peaks of Lebanon, which rise majestically in the distant heights beyond. In that magical hour that passed between the spirits of those who slept and the dreams of infinity, Nathan, the son of the high priest, entered the temple of Astarte. In his trembling hand, he carried a torch, with which he lit the lamps and the censuries. The sweet smell of incense and myrrh rose sexy in the air, and the image of the goddess was adorned with a delicate veil, like the veil of desire and anxiety that surrounds the human heart. Nathan prostrate himself before the altar covered in ivory and gold, raised his hands in supplication and turned his tearful eyes to heaven. With his voice choked with pain and broken by pitiful sobs, he exclaimed, Mercy, O great Astarte! Mercy, O goddess of love and beauty! Have mercy on me and keep the hand away from death, my beloved, whom my soul has chosen to do your will. The potions and powders of the doctors had no effect, and the spells of priests and scholars were in vain. I just have to resort to your sacred name, so you can help me and help me. Listen to my prayer, look to my contrite heart and the agony of my spirit, and let live what is part of my soul, so that we may rejoice in the secrets of your love and rejoice in the beauty of youth, which proclaims your glory. From the bottom of my being I cry out to you, Saint Astarte. From the darkness of this night I seek the protection of your mercy. Listen to my plea. I am his servant Nada, son of Hirau, the priest, who dedicated his life to the service of his altar. I love a maiden I chose among all, but evil spirits blew into her, in her beautiful body, the breath of a strange disease. They sent the messenger of death to take her to her enchanted caves. This messenger is now roaring like a hungry beast near his bed. Spreading her black wings over her, and extending her claws to pluck her from my side. That's why I came to beg you. Have mercy on me and let her live. It is a flower that has not yet lived the summer of its existence, a little bird whose cheerful groans that greet the dawn were interrupted. Save her from the clutches of death and we will sing her praises and burn offerings for the glory of her name. We will take victims to your altar, fill your vases with wine and aromatic oil, and spread roses and jasmine in your tabernacle. Before his image, we will burn incense and pleasant aloe. Save her, O goddess of miracles, and allow love to overcome death, for you are the queen of love and death. Nathan stopped talking for a moment, crying and sighing in his deep pain. Then he continued. I deem, Saint Astarte. My dreams are nightmares, and the last breath of my life is approaching, my heart is dying inside me, 
and my eyes are filled with burning tears. Hold me with your compassion and let my beloved be with me. At that moment, one of Nathan's slaves entered the temple, approached slowly and whispered in his ear. Lord, she opened her eyes, and seeks you, but does not see you. I came to you because he calls you constantly. Nathan got up and ran out of the temple, followed closely by his slave. Arriving at his palace, he entered the room where the sick girl was lying down and stopped by his bed. He took her slender hand and kissed her many times, as if he wanted to infuse a new breath into that emaciated body. She turned her face, which was hidden among silk pads, looked at him, and the shadow of a smile appeared on the patient's lips, the only living thing left of that beautiful body, it was like the last ray of light of an already destitured spirit, like him. Echo of a lament in a heart that felt that the end was near. He spoke, and his breath was like the gentle hiccup of a hungry child. The gods call me, husband of my soul, and death has come to separate me. Do not repent, for the will of the gods is sacred, and the demands of death are just. I go now, but the twin bowls of love and youth are still full in our hands, and the paths of joyful life extend before us. I will, my beloved, go to the realm of spirits, but I will return to this world. A start returns to this life the souls of lovers who go to infinity before savoring the delights of love and the joys of youth. We will meet again, Nathan, and together we will drink the morning dew in the bowls of the daffodils, and rejoice in the sun with the birds of the field. See you soon, my love. The girl's voice fell to a whisper, and her lips began to tremble like flower petals in the dawn breeze. Nathan hugged her, wetting her neck with bitter tears. When Nathan's lips touched the girl's mouth, she felt it cold as ice. The young man let out a terrible cry, tore his clothes and threw himself upon that corpse, while Nathan's spirit, in his agony, was suspended between the deep sea of life and the abyss of death. In the calm of that night, the eyelids of those who slept before trembled, and the women of the neighborhood sobbed, and the souls of the children were afraid, for darkness and silence were filled with high-pitched groans, which rose from the palace of the priest of Astarte. When dawn dawned, the people sought Nathan to comfort him in his affliction, but they did not find him. Many days later, when the caravan arrived from the east, the guide told that he had seen Nada far away in the desert, wandering like a lost soul among the gazelles. Centuries passed, and the feet of time collapsed the works of the ages. The ancient gods left the earth and other gods took their place, they were gods of fury, eager for ruin and destruction. They raised the beautiful temple of the city of the sun and destroyed its beautiful palaces. Its once green gardens withered and fertile fields turned into desolate wasteland. In that valley there were only ruins, specters of yesterday that resembled the faint echo of the psalms sung in passing. Glories. But the eras, passing and sweeping the works of man, cannot destroy their dreams, nor weaken their deepest feelings and emotions, feelings and emotions are enduring, like the immortal spirit. They can hide sometimes, but they only hide temporarily, like the sun at sunset, or like the moon, when the morning approaches. Spring 1890 The day was dying, the light fading as the sun lifted its robes from the plains of Baalbek. Ali al-Husseini led his flock toward the temple ruins, stopping to sit on the fallen columns. They looked like the ribs of a soldier who had been left there long ago, broken in battle and bare by the elements. The sheep gathered around him, grazing and feeling protected by the melodies of his flute. Midnight came, and the heavens cast the seeds of tomorrow into their dark depths. Ali's eyelids flashed. They felt tired of the specters of wakefulness. His mind was tired of the processions of imaginary beings, 
marching in deep silence among those ruined walls. She rested her head on her arm as she felt sleep crawling through her body, gently covering her insomnia with the folds of her veil, like a light mist touching the surface of a still lake. He thus forgot his earthly being and saw his spiritual being, his hidden being was filled with dreams that transcend the laws and teachings of men. A strange sight appeared before his eyes, and the hidden things were revealed to him. His spirit broke with the procession of time rushing into nothingness. He stood alone before the closed rows of conflicting thoughts and emotions. He first knew, or intuited, the causes of the spiritual hunger that plagued his youth. It was a hunger in which all the bitterness and all the sweetness of existence were combined. It was a seed that awakened in a single cry the anxiety and serenity of fullness. It was a longing that not even all the glory of this world can overshadow, and the course of life cannot hide. For the first time in his existence, Ali al husseini felt a strange sensation before the ruins of that temple. It was a senseless sensation, the memory of incense rising from the sensories. An obsessive feeling that touched the fibers of his spirit like the musician's fingers, the strings of his ward. And that feeling came from the realm of nothing, or maybe of yourself. The sensation grew to involve his whole spiritual being. He felt his soul invaded by an ecstasy, similar to death, in his darkness and in his sweetness, with a pleasant pain in his bitterness, caressing in his hardness. It was something that arose from the vast spaces of a minute's sleep. A minute that gave rise to the forms of all epochs, just as all nations are born of a seed. There he looked at the ruined temple, and his weariness gave way to an awakening of the spirit. He clearly perceived, in their original form, the ruins of the altar, and the places of the fallen columns, and the bases of the collapsed walls. His eyes were dimmed and his heart beat hard, as if a blind man suddenly regained his sight and began to see and reflect. And from this chaos of confused thoughts, mixed with reflection, the ghosts of memory were born, and he remembered everything. He remembered those pillars when they rose majestically and proud, he remembered the silver lamps and sensaries that surrounded the image of a revered goddess. He remembered the venerable priests carrying their offerings before the altar covered in ivory and gold. He remembered the maidens singing praises to the goddess of love and beauty. He remembered all this with some clarity. He felt the figures of sleeping things come to life, in the silences of his deep being. But memory has only brought you confusing forms, and memory brings us only the echoes of the voices we once heard. It was more than a memory, what was the bond that united those memories of a past life, of a young man raised among the tents, who had lived the spring of his life caring for his flock in the wild valleys. There he rose and walked among the ruins and the broken stones. These distant memories lifted the veil of oblivion of her mind, like a woman taking a spider's web out of the mirror. So, thinking about these things, he reached the center of the temple, as if a magical attraction had guided his steps. And suddenly, he saw before him a broken statue, lying on the ground. Involuntarily, he prostrated himself in front of that image. Religious feelings flowed through him like blood from an open wound, his heartbeat was like the waves of the sea, rising and falling. He breathed a sigh, feeling humble and reverent, and Ali wept, for he felt a devastating pain, an immense loneliness, and an annihilating distance that paraded his spirit from that spirit of beauty that was at his side before living his present life. He felt his own essence as part of a flame that God had separated from his being before the beginning of time. He felt in the febrile bones the slight vibration of the soul, and in the silent cells of his brain he felt that a powerful and sublime love took possession of his soul and his heart. A love that revealed to the spirit the hidden things of the spirit, and that with its power separated the mind from the regions of measure and weight. 
a love that we hear when the tongues of life are changed, that we contemplate as a vertical column, as a pillar of fire, when darkness hides everything and everything. This love and this infinite being descended into Ali's spirit and awakened in him bitter and sweet feelings at the same time, just as the sun gives beauty to the flowers, but also to the thorns. What is this love? Where do you come from? What do you ask a young man who rests with his flock among the ruined temples? What is this wine that flows through the veins of the beautiful maidens left indifferent? What did that love mean and where did it come from? What did Ali want, who only cared for his sheep and played the flute, away from men? Would it be something planted in your heart by earthly beauties, without your senses noticing it? Or was it a bright light veiled by the mist, beginning to illuminate the emptiness of your soul? Or was it a dream that came in the dead of night to mock him, or a truth that existed and will exist from the beginning to the end of time? There he closed his eyes full of tears and opened his hands like a beggar in search of mercy. He felt that his spirit trembled, from this trembling came hiccups that were both complaints and fire of anxiety. With a voice almost inaudible as a slight sigh, Ali asked. Who are you, who is so close to my heart without my eyes seeing you, disp rod me from myself, and joining my gift to the distant and forgotten times? Are you an imp, a spirit that comes from the world of the immortals to tell me about the vanity of life and the fragility of the flesh? Are you perhaps the spirit of the queen of geniuses who came out of the bounism of the earth to enslave my senses and turn me into the laughter of my tribe's youth? Who are you, and what temptation is this, who advances unresistibly and destroys, taking care of my heart? What are these feelings that fill me with fire and light? Who am I and who is this new being I call I, but who is a stranger to myself? The source of life I absorb with the particles of the air and myself became an angel who sees and hears all the secret things. I'm drunk with the devil's breath, and I'm blind to the... There he remained silent for a long time, his emotion gained strength and his spirit seemed to grow. Then he spoke again and said, O oh you, who reveals yourself to the spirit and approaches him, hidden in the night and distant, O oh beautiful spirit that wanders in the spaces of my dreams, you awakened in me feelings that slept like seeds of flowers hidden under the snow, and that you passed like a breeze, vehicle of the breath of the fields. You touched my senses to the point of making them swing like the leaves of a tree. Let me see you if you have a body and substances. Order the sleep to close my harps, so that I may see you in my sleep if you are free from the moorings of the earth. Let me touch you, let me hear your voice. Remove the veil that covers my whole being and destroy the fabric that hides what is divine in me. Give me wings, so I can fly behind you to the regions where spirits gather, if you are an inhabitant of these regions. Touch my eyelids with your magic, and I'll follow you to the secret places where the good geniuses live, if you're one of the nymphs. Put your invisible hand in my heart and take me if you have the power to make your chosen ones follow you. Then Ali whispered in the ears of the darkness the words that arose from the echo of a melody in the depths of his heart. Between his vision and his surroundings floated the ghosts of the night, like incense rising from his burning tears and on the walls of the temple appeared colorful magic paintings in the shades of the rainbow. So it's been an hour. He felt joy in the midst of his tears and rejoiced in the midst of his pain, he heard the beats of his heart and looked beyond all the sensitive things, as if the forms of this life were being erased, and in his place a wonderful dream ascertained full of beauty and imposing images. As a prophet who looks at the stars in the sky in search of divine inspiration, Ali waited for the next few minutes. His anxious breath became a calm breath and his spirit seemed to leave him and wander around him, and then return, as if he were searching among those ruins for the spirit of a loved one. 
It dawned and the silence trembled in the breeze. The vast spaces smiled well like those who sleep and see in dreams the image of the loved one. Birds emerged from the cracks in the crumbling walls and moved between the pillars, singing, calling and hailing the arrival of the day. There he stood up and took his feverish hand to his forehead, then looked around like anyone who doesn't know where it is. Then, as Adam opened his eyes with the breath of God, he looked at him with admiration. He went to his sheep and called them, they got up, shook and ran calmly behind him into the green pastures. There he walked in front of his flock, his big eyes fixed on the serene atmosphere. His inner senses fled from reality, to reveal to him the secrets and hidden things of existence, to make him see what had happened in bygone eras and what was yet to happen, and the vision was like lightning that made him forget everything and return to his anguish and vague desire. And he found between him and the spirit of his spirit a veil like a canvas between the eye and the light. He sighed, and a flame seemed to rise from his burning heart. He came to the stream whose murmurs proclaimed the secrets of the fields and sat on his shore, under a willow whose branches dipped in the water, as if they wanted to suck the sweetness out of the liquid element. Sheep grazed near him, and the morning dew shone in the white wool. A minute later, Ali felt his heartbeat accelerate again, and he felt the restlessness in his spirit as well. Like one who wakes up to the rays of the sun, he looked around and saw a girl with a jar on her shoulder emerge from the trees. Slowly, the young woman walked toward the stream, his bare feet were wet with dew, and as he approached the edge of the creek, he looked to the other side of the bank, and his gaze found that of Ali. The young woman screamed, dropped the jar on the floor and took a few steps back. It was the attitude of those who come back to find someone who got lost. A minute passed, whose seconds were like lamps that illuminated the path between the two hearts, a strange melody was created from the silence that involved the two young men in the echo of vague memories, and which took them elsewhere, surrounded by shadows and figures, far from that flow and from those trees. They looked at each other with supplicating glances, and each found favor in the eyes of the other, and heard the sighs of the other with the ears of love. They communicated in all the tongues of the spirit, and when full understanding and full knowledge were attained in their two soul mates, Ali crossed the chain, as if guided by an invisible power. He approached the girl, hugged her and kissed her lips, neck and eyelids. The young woman stood motionless in Ali's arms, as if the sweetness of that embrace had robbed her of her, and as if those caresses had taken away all her strength. She gave herself to his caresses as the fragrance of jasmine to the air currents. She supported her head on her beloved's chest, like a being full of fatigue and who finally finds rest, and sighed deeply, with a sigh that expressed the birth of joy and calm in a lonely heart, and which also expressed the palpitation of life that was asleep, and which at that moment awoke. The young woman raised her head and looked her lover in the eyes, with that look that dispenses with the usual language of men and who chooses silence to express love, it was the language of the spirit, it was the gaze of those who are not content with love being a soul trapped in the body of words. Both lovers walked among the willows, and the individuality of each was a language of two individualities merged into a single being, and the ears silently listened to the inspiration of love, and the eyes contemplated the glory of happiness. The sheep followed them, nibbling the flowers and herbs, and the birds arose from everywhere, accompanying them with charming trills. By the time the two lovers reached the other end of the valley, the sun had already been born completely, extending a golden robe to the heights. They sat on a stone that shadowed some shy violets. The girl fixed her gaze on Ali's black eyes, while the breeze played with the young man's hair, and it was as if invisible lips were kissing her. She felt magical fingers caressing her tongue and lips, dominating her will. After a while the girl spoke and said, 
with a sweetness that almost hurt Ali's soul. A start made our souls return to this life, my beloved, so that the delights of love and the glory of youth may not be unrelated to us. There he closed his eyes, because the music of those words crystallized the forms of a dream he had many times. He felt that invisible wings took him away from that place, to a strangely shaped enclosure. There he found himself standing beside a bed on which lay the body of a beautiful woman, whose beauty death had taken away by taking the heat from her lips. He screamed in anguish as he watched the horrific scene. Then he opened his eyes and saw the maiden, sitting beside him, on those lips there was a smile of love, and in that gaze shone the rays of life. Ali's face lit up, his spirit comforted, the terrifying visions fled and he forgot the past and the future. The lovers hugged and drank the wine with two kisses until they quenched their love. They slept in each other's arms until the shadows dissipated, and until the heat of the sun woke them up. Johanna the Madwoman I During the summer, Johanna went out into the fields every morning, driving her oxen and carrying the pout on her shoulder, while listening to the chirping of birds and the murmur of wind in the leaves of the trees. At noon he sat on the banks of the dancing stream that snaked through the green meadows, and there ate, always leaving the remains of his food on the grass for the birds. At night, as the sun set and daylight dissipated, he would return to his humble abode in the hills, from where the villages of northern Lebanon could be seen. There, he sat at the table in the company of his elderly parents, and listened calmly to their conversation, and his comments about the daily events, and gradually a restful sleep took him. During the winter, he would sit by the fire of the fireplace and hear the sighs of the wind and the cry of the elements, watching one season succeed the other. From the window he looked out into the valleys covered with his snow mantle and the defoliated trees, like a crowd of needy abandoned to the intense cold and hurricane winds. On the long winter nights, he stayed awake long after his parents went to bed. And he opened an old wooden chest, from which he took the book of the Gospels, to read it secretly in the dim light of a lamp, and from time to time looked in the direction of his sleeping father, who had forbidden him to read the holy book. The prohibition was due to the fact that priests did not allow simple and ignorant people to spy on the secrets of Jesus' teachings. And if they read the book, the church would excommunicate them. This is how Johanna spent the days of her wonderful youth, between those fields of wonderful beauty and the book of Jesus, full of luminous teachings and spiritual values. Whenever her father spoke, Johanna remained silent, listening to him with respect. Sometimes he would sit among his young companions like him, and also remain silent, looking over them at the line where dusk touched the blue of the sky. Whenever I went to church I came back sad, because the teachings that were given from the pulpit and the altar were not like those who read in the Gospels. In addition, Johanna noted that the life of faithful and spiritual pastors was not the beautiful life that Jesus the Nazarene had spoken of. Spring returned to the fields and meadows, and the snow melted. At the top of the mountains there was still some snow, which then melted too and went down the slopes like a stream that snaked through the low valleys. Soon the streams came together to form wider rivers, whose torrents heralded everyone that nature had awakened from their sleep. Apple trees and walnut trees flourished, and the poplars and willows laid new leaves, in the heights the green grass grew and the flowers bloomed. Johanna got tired of her existence by the fireplace, the cattle were restless in the barn, anxious for green pastures, for the supply of straw and rye was almost over. Then Johanna released the cattle from his corral and led him into the open field. He carried his Bible hidden under the mantle, so that no one could see it, and reached the meadow near the end of the valley, adjacent to the fields of a monastery that rose its black silhouette like a tower between the slopes of the hills. There, the cattle spread to graze. 
Johanna sat with her back against a rock and looked into the valley in all its beauty, while, from time to time, she read the book that told her about the kingdom of heaven. It was a day at the end of Lent, when the villagers, who refrained from eating meat, eagerly awaited the arrival of Easter. But Johanna, like all poor peasants, did not know the difference between fasting days and days of plenty, for him, all existence was a long day of fasting. His food consisted of a piece of bread, crumpled with the sweat of his face, and fruits bought with the product of hard work. For him, refraining from meat and rich delicacies came naturally. And fasting produced not bodily hunger, but spiritual hunger, he communicated to him the sorrow of the Son of Man and the end of Jesus' life on earth. The little birds flew around Johanna, calling each other, and there were flocks of pigeons flying over her head, the flowers swung softly in the breeze bathing in the warm rays of the sun. And Johanna read, focusing on his book, and from time to time raised his head reflecting on what he read, he saw the domes of the churches of the villages scattered throughout the valley and heard the chimes of the bells. He closed his eyes and let his spirit fly through the centuries to old Jerusalem, to follow in Jesus' footsteps through the streets, asking passers-by about him. He imagined that they answered him, here he healed blind and paralyzed. There they made him a crown of thorns and placed it on his head. In these streets he stopped his footsteps and spoke to the people in parables in which they tied him to a column and spat in his face and whipped him, in that garden he forgiven the harlot, the sins. There he fell under the weight of the cross. Hours passed, while Johanna suffered from the agony of the body of the God-man, and was exalted with him in spirit. When Johanna got up, the sun was at the zenith. He looked around him, searching everywhere for his cows, perplexed by his disappearance in those flat pastures. And when he reached the road that goes to the fields like the lines of the palm, he saw in the distance a man dressed in black, still in the middle of the gardens. She hurried the step to find him and, as she approached, saw that he was one of the monks of the monastery. Johanna bowed his head, greeted the monk and asked if he had seen his calves in the gardens. The monk, trying to hide his anger, looked intensely at Johanna and answered harshly, Yes, I saw them, there they are, come with me, and you'll see them. Johanna followed the monk until they reached the monastery, there she saw her calves locked in a corral, tied with ropes and guarded by another monk. That monk carried in his hand a thick rod, with which he beat the beasts every time they moved. As Johanna tried to enter the corral to take his animals, the monk grabbed him by the cover and, turning his head toward the monastery door, shouted, Here's the guilty pastor, I've got him. Hearing that cry, the priests and monks advanced, led by the superior, who distinguished himself from his companions by his finely dressed clothes and severe features. They surrounded Johanna as soldiers disputed spoils. Johanna turned to the top and said in kind tone, What have I done for you to call me a criminal, and why did you capture me? The superior replied with a rough voice. You brought these cattle to graze on the monastery grounds, and they ruined our vineyards. We seized the animals because the shepherd is responsible for the damage caused by the cattle. The superior's angry face became more severe as he spoke. Johanna replied, humble. Father, they are creatures without intelligence, and I am a poor man who has nothing but the strength of his arms and these beasts. Let me take you with me and I promise never to return to those meadows. The superior priest took a step forward, raised his hand to heaven and said, God placed us in this place and entrusted us with custody of this land, which was the land of his chosen prophet Elijah. We keep this land day and night, for it is a sacred land, 
those who approach it will be consumed by eternal fire. If you refuse to account for your actions to the monastery, the grass will turn into poison in the bowels of your animals. And there will be no escape for you, for we will keep the animals in our corral until you pay the damages. The superior was already leaving when Yuhana stopped him and said in a supplicant voice, I pray you, my lord, for those holy days when Jesus suffered for us and Mary wept in pain, let me go with my animals. Don't be mean to me, I'm a poor man, and the monastery is rich and powerful. Surely he will forgive me for my foolishness and feel sorry for my father. The superior looked at him with mockery and contempt and said, The monastery will not forgive you nor the value of a single grain, stupid, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. And you are no one to conjure me in the name of sacred things, because only we know the secrets of the sacred mysteries. To take your animals, you will have to pay three denarii for the damage they have caused. Father, said Johanna in a trembling voice, I have nothing, not a copper coin. Have mercy on me and my poverty. The superior stroked his beard and said, In that case, go away and sell part of your land, and come back with the three denarii. Isn't it better for you to enter the kingdom of heaven, even if you do not possess a piece of land, than to draw Elijah's wrath with your obstinate arguments before your altar, and go to hell, where all is eternal fire. Yohanna was silent for a while. Then his eyes lit up and his features showed great joy. His attitude changed, from supplication, to the attitude of strength and resolution. When he spoke again, his voice had the knowledge and determination of youth. Should the poor sell the land with which they earn the bread of each day, to fill more the coffers of the monastery where gold and silver abound? Do the poor need to be poorer and starve for the great Elijah to forgive the sins of hungry animals? The superior raised his head proudly and replied. Jesus the Christ said, to those who have been given more, in abundance, but to whom he has nothing, even the little he has shall be taken from him. Upon hearing these words, Johanna felt her heart beat faster, he felt his spirit gain stature. It was as if the earth was growing at your feet. He took the Bible out of his pocket, as the warrior who unheeded the sword to defend himself, and exclaimed, Then you mock the teachings of this book, hypocrites, and use the most sacred to spread evil. A to you when the Son of Man comes for the second time and turns your monasteries into ruins, spread your stones in the valley and burn your islets and your images to fire. May the innocent blood of Jesus fall upon you, and the tears of your mother, which will lead you to the depths of the abyss. A I deed to you, who worshipped idols of your greed and that you hide in your dark habits the greatest blackness of your actions. A I day of you, who move your lips reciting prayers, while your hearts are hard as rock, that you proceed humbly before the ishers, but that in your souls you may rebel against God. In your hardness of heart, you brought me to this place as a transgressor who took some of the grass from the land that the sun cultivated for all of us. When I beg in the name of Jesus and in the days of his passion, you mock me as someone who does not know what he is saying. Take this book, read it, and show me when Jesus did not forgive. Read this divine tragedy and tell me when Jesus spoke without mercy and without compassion. Was it in the Sermon of the Mountain, or in his teachings in the temple, before the persecutors of the whore, or on Golgot, when he opened his arms on the cross to embrace all mankind? Look down, all of you with a hard heart, and behold these poor villages in whose dwellings the sick agonists in pain beds, look at those prisons in which the unfortunate scare the days with despair, look at those rich doors to which beggars arrive, see those roads where the poor foreigner sleeps, and see in those cemeteries how the widow and orphan weep. Instead, you live here in idleness and leisure, 
enjoying the fruits of the land and the grapes of the vineyard. You never visit sick or prisoners, you never offer food to those who are hungry, or give shelter to strangers, nor comfort those who suffer. And you are not happy with what you have and stole from our ancestors, you stretch out your hands like a poisonous snake extends its head to steal from the widow the work of her hands and the peasant her savings for old age. Johanna stopped talking to catch her breath, and then continued, her head held high proudly, but she said quietly. There's too many of you, and I'm alone. Do with me what you want. The sheep may be attacked by wolves in the dead of night, but their blood will stain the valley stones until dawn and the sun rises. So spoke Johanna, and in his voice there was a force of inspiration, a force that kept the monks immobile and caused them a growing anger. The monks trembled in anger and gnawed their teeth like hungry lions, waiting for a sign from the chief to fall on the young man and destroy him. They remained silent until Johanna stopped talking and was silent, like the calm after a storm that tore apart the tallest branches of the trees and the strongest plants. Then the superior cried, full of anger. Grab that wretched sinner, take out your book and immerse it in a dark cell, those who curse God's elect will have no forgiveness, neither here nor in the other world. The monks fell upon Johanna like a lion upon his prey, they tied his arms and took him to a small cell, and before locking the door they injured his body with punches and kicks. And in that dark place was Johanna, the victorious one, whom an ungrateful fortune made captive of her enemies. Through a narrow crevice in the wall, he looked into the valley, which was in the sunlight. His face lit up and his spirit felt the embrace of divine resignation, a sweet tranquility took care of him. The small cell imprisoned his body, but his spirit felt free, wandering in the breeze between the meadows and the ruins. The hands of the monks hurt their limbs, but they did not touch their deepest feelings, and in them he felt in peace and secure, in the company of Jesus of Nazareth. Persecution does not harm the righteous, nor does oppression destroy those on the side of truth. Socrates drank the hemlock smiling, Paul rejoiced when he was stoned. It only hurts us to owe ourselves to the hidden consciousness, because when we betray it, it hurts us. Johanna's parents found out what had happened to their only child. The mother went to the monastery walking with the help of the cane, and threw herself at the feet of the superior priest. She cried and kissed her hands and begged forgiveness for her son and his ignorance. Father Prior raised his eyes to heaven as one who is beyond the things of this world, and said to his wife, We can forgive your son's recklessness and be tolerant of his foolishness, but, the monastery has sacred rites that must be respected. We, in our humility, forgive the offenders of men, but the great Elijah does not forgive those who desecrated their vineyards and those who graze the beasts on their sacred ground. The mother looked at the monk as bitter tears flowed down his wrinkled cheeks. Then he took a silver necklace from his neck and, putting it in the monk's hand, said. Dad, the only thing I have is this necklace my mom gave me on my wedding day. I hope the monastery will take it as payment for my only son's guilt. The senior priest took the necklace and put it in his pocket, and while that mother kissed his hands with gratitude, he said, AI of this generation, who interpreted the verses of the holy book backwards and ate bitter grapes. Go in peace, good woman, and pray to heaven to heal your son and restore him to reason. Johanna got out of prison and walked slowly leading her cattle, at his side was his mother, leaning on a cane and bent under the weight of the years. When they arrived at the hut, the boy locked the beasts in the barn and sat at the window, silent, watching the sunset light. After a while, he heard his father whisper in his mother's ear. Sarah, I often told you that our son was weak in the head, but you never agreed with me. Now, don't contradict me, 
because your actions have given birth to my words. What the superior father told you now, I've been telling you for years. Johanna stood motionless, looking west, where the rays of the setting sun colored the dense masses of clouds. 2. It was Easter time, and fast days were followed by days of rejoicing. The new temple was completed, rising above the houses of Bishari, like the palace of a prince in the midst of the humble residences of his subjects. The people were gathered and awaited the arrival of the bishop, who would consecrate the sanctuary and the Reha cells. And as the time of the prelate's arrival approached, the people left the village in procession, and the dignitary entered the village with them between songs of praise of the peasants and solemn chants of the priests, between cymbal music and bell sings. As the bishop dismounted from his horse he carried a beautiful saddle and silver rein, the religious and notables of the village came to greet him, welcoming him with solemn words and liturgical chants. When the bishop arrived at the new church, they dressed him in gold embroidered tailor robes and placed a crown encrusted with precious stones. Then they gave him the finely carved staff studded with precious stones. He walked through the church, singing with the other priests, while richly scented incense lint rose into the air and many lit candles burned. At that moment, Johanna was among the shepherds and peasants, on a platform, watching the spectacle with a sad look. He sighed bitterly at the view, on the one hand, of robes of seed and gold vases, sensaries and expensive silver lamps, and on the other hand saw the poorly dressed peasants, who came from their small villages to rejoice in the feast, and the consecration ceremony. On the one hand, I saw the powerful velvet and satin dresses, on the other, the wretched were covered in pitiful rags. Wealth and power adorned religion with liturgical songs, and the poor, humble, and weak, rejoiced in the mysteries of the resurrection. The prayers and whispers that arose from broken hearts floated in the ether. On the one hand, leaders and notables were full of life like exuberant cypress trees. On the other hand, there were the peasants, the submissive, whose existence is a ship captained by death, those whose rudder is broken by the waves and whose sails are torn by the wind, the poor, torn between the anguish of the abyss and the terror of the storm. On the one hand, oppressive tyranny, on the other, blind obedience. Are they related to each other? Tyranny is a strong tree that only grows in lowlands. Isn't submission an abandoned field where only thorns grow? These sad reflections and these torturous thoughts occupied Johanna's mind. He slapped his chest and took his hands to his throat, fearing to choke, as if his breath wanted to escape from his chest. And so it remained until the end of the consecration ceremony, when the people began to disperse. Johanna began to feel a spirit floating in the air urging him to stand up and speak on his behalf, in the crowd, an unknown power impelled him to preach before heaven and earth. Johanna went to the end of the platform and, looking up, made a sign to the heavens with his hand. In a powerful voice that caught the attention of the spectators, he cried out, Look, O Jesus, man of Nazareth, who are sitting in the circle of light at the heights, look from the blue dome of the heavens to this earth whose elements you wore as a tunic. Look at us, faithful peasant, because the thorns killed the flowers whose seeds made them germinate with the sweat of your forehead. Look, O good shepherd, for the weak lamb you carry on your shoulder has been torn apart by the beasts. His innocent blood is wasted on the earth, and his burning tears have dried in the hearts of men. The heat of his breath spread through the winds of the desert. This field trodden by his feet has become a battlefield where the feet of the powerful crush the ribs of the dispossessed, where the oppressor's hand suffocates the spirit of the weak. The persecuted cry in the dark, and those who sit on thrones in your name do not hear such cries, nor hear the cries of the afflicted who preach thy words from the pulpits. 
the lamb you sent as the Lord's messenger of life became an animal of prey that shatters the lamb you carried in your arms. The world of life you brought from the heart of God is hidden in the pages of books, and instead of life there is a cry of fear and misery in all hearts. These people, O oh Jesus, erected temples and tabernacles for the glory of thy name, and adorned them with precious seed and molten gold. To do this, they left the poor, their chosen ones, naked in the cold streets, however, priests burn incense and light candles. They stole the bread of those who believe in their divinity. And while the air echoes his psalms and hymns, the priests do not hear the orphan's cry or the widow's lamentations. Therefore, a second time comes, O Jesus, and casts out from the temple those who negotiate religion, for they have made it a disgusting nest of vipers full of poison. Come and admoni these Caesars who have stolen from the poor what belongs to God. Here's the vineyard your right hand man planted. The vermin devoured their tender branches and their grapes are trampled in vain. Consider all those to whom you have brought peace, and see how divided they are, and how they fight each other, and the victims of their wars are troubled souls and oppressed hearts. On days of celebration and religious celebrations, priests raise their voices desiring glory to God in the heights and peace on earth and joy to all men. Is your heavenly Father glorified when corrupt lips and lying tongues speak his name? Is there peace on earth when the children of suffering plow the fields and see their forces weakening in the sunlight to fill the mouths of the powerful and the bowels of tyrants? Is there joy when the dispossessed see death as deliverance? What is peace, sweet Jesus? Is that what is in the eyes of hungry children and the breasts of hungry mothers living in cold, dark dwellings? Is it what is in the bodies of the needy, who sleep in stone beds dreaming of food that never reaches them, because priests throw it to pigs? What is joy, O oh Jesus? Is there joy when a prince can buy the strength of men and the honor of women for some silver coins? Can there be joy in those silent slaves of body and soul whose eyes are dazzled by the jewels and rings and robes of the priest's seed? Is there rejoicing in the cries of the oppressed when tyrants fall upon them with a sword in their hands and crush the bodies of their women and children with the hoofs of their horses, soaking the earth with the blood of the poor? Extend your mighty hand, O Jesus, and save us, for the oppressor's hand weighs on us. Or send us to death, to lead us to the tomb, where we will rest in peace until your second coming, protected by the shadow of your cross. For in fact our life is only the kingdom of darkness, whose inhabitants are evil spirits, and a valley where serpents and dragons swarm. Our lives are nothing more than swords that are hidden in our beds at night and fall over our heads during the day whenever the love of existence takes us to the fields. Have mercy on us, O Jesus, of these multitudes that gather in your name on the day of resurrection. Have compassion for our weakness and humility. So said Johanna looking up at the sky as people surrounded him. Some approved his words and praised him, others were angry and warned him. A peasant cried out. He tells the truth, and tells us by putting heaven as a witness, for we are the oppressed. Another commented, this man is possessed by the devil and speaks to us in the language of an evil spirit. Another said, we have never heard so much nonsense, nor do we want to hear. And yet another whispered in his neighbor's ear, when I heard his voice, I felt a trembling that shook my heart, for this man spoke with a strange power. And that neighbor answered, that's right, but our religious pastors know more about these things than we do, it's a mistake to doubt them. And as the screams arose from everywhere and became an outcry like the waves of the sea, which disperse and get lost in the ether, a priest appeared and grabbed Johanna and handed him over to the police. They took him to the governor's residence and asked him questions he did not answer, remembering that Jesus had remained silent before his persecutors. 
Then they threw him in a dark prison, and there Johanna slept that night, touching his head against the stone wall. And the next morning, Johanna's father appeared before the governor to witness his son's madness. Lord, said Johanna's father, I have heard him often babble in his solitude and speak of strange things that do not exist. Night after night he spoke in silence, with strange words, calling the shadows with a terrible voice, like sorcerers when they cast enchantments. Ask the neighboring boys who are their classmates, because they know that my son's mind was drawn to a strange world. When these boys spoke to him, he rarely responded, and when he did, my son's words were dragged and had nothing to do with the conversation. Ask his mother, because she, more than anyone, knows that our son's soul has lost its mind. She often saw him look at the horizon with a lost gaze, and heard him speak passionately about the trees, streams, and flowers, and stars, with childish and confused language. Ask the monks of the monastery, with whom you fought yesterday, mocking the sacred things and scorning the holy life they lead. My son is crazy, sir, but he's nice to his mother and me. He sustains us in our old age and supply our needs with the sweat of his face. Be merciful to him and with us, and forgive him his follies in honor of his parents. Johanna was freed and the story of her madness spread everywhere. The young men spoke of him with mockery, but the maidens looked at him with sadness and said, The heavens are responsible for strange things in men. Thus, in this young man beauty joins madness, and the light of his beautiful eyes joins the darkness of his sick soul. Between the hills and meadow, covered in her dress of plants and flowers, Johanna was sitting near her calves, who came to those good pastures fleeing the violence and struggle of men. Johanna looked, with eyes clouded with tears, the villages and farmhouses scattered on the slopes of the valley, and exuding a deep sigh, often repeated these words. There's too many of you and I'm alone. Say what you want about me, and do with me what you want. The sheep may be prey of wolves in the dead of night, but their blood will stain the stones of the valley until dawn and the sun rises again.